tuned in, and we appreciate those that tuned in this morning. Uh, we got a lot of comments on both services, Brother Aaron's message and the message that God laid on my heart this morning for the church. And we appreciate it that you are tuned in tonight. But before we look into God's word, I would like to get uh, some commercial in. I always try to do that uh, because there may be some of you out there listening or watching uh, tonight that do not know much about Berean Baptist Church. Berean Baptist Church is what we would call an old fashioned, fundamental uh, Baptist church. We worship in the old traditional Baptist way. We sing the old hymns from the hymn book. We teach and preach from the King James Bible only. We believe it is the true preserved word of God, and we, we believe that all other translations are a perversion of the word of God. Our church is friendly. Our church is spirit-filled. Our services are informal. Uh, our, and our music is, is spiritual, and our message is scriptural. So if you, when the virus is over and you're looking for a, a, a traditional Baptist church that still believes in the old past, still believes in doing the things the way God would have it to be done in the Bible, we just invite you to come and uh, visit us. That's all we ask. Come and visit us and get acquainted with us and us with you. And you would be most welcome at Berean Baptist Church, 17377 Godwin Avenue here in Port Charlie. All right, that's the commercial. If you got your Bibles tonight, open them up to 2 Timothy. <clears throat> Excuse me, first of all, chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I, I want to read a couple of verses uh, t uh, from God's Word. 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse 7. Paul writes this, Consider what I say. And the Lord give the understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Wherein I suffer trouble and as, as an evildoer, even unto bonds. But the word of God is not bound. I want to direct your attention for a few moments tonight, if I might. To the words of Paul here, he had written to Timothy, his young preacher, man, uh, young young preacher man. He was sort of a protege of Paul, and Paul was uh, uh, teaching him and guiding him and praying for him and leading him along as a young pastor. But I want you to notice tonight the words in the, uh, in, in verse eight, where Paul says these words according to my gospel you find that the burning consuming desire of the apostle paul from the moment that he was converted to jesus christ on the road to damascus until the hour that he laid down his life at a roman prison his consuming passion was simply this the preaching of the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. For Paul believed this. He believed that through the preaching of the gospel that people were to be saved. In fact, he wrote in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, in all of Paul's writings, all of the epistles that he wrote, you find that he mentioned 66 times in some way, in some association, 66 times he speaks of the gospel uh, therein. Uh, <clears throat> so he believed that it was the preaching of the gospel uh, on it. If you have, I want to show you something. In Galatians, if you have your Bibles, turn, uh, turn with me to Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 and 9. Galatians 1, 6 and 9.
Paul was so adamant about the gospel. Paul was so defensive about the gospel. So uh, Paul was so uh, uh, consumed about spreading and preaching and teaching the gospel. He said this in Galatians 1, 6. He says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you under the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there would be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have uh, and that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And we said before, so say I now again, Paul writes, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. <clears throat> what Paul was saying and, and what we believe tonight is the very same gospel that Paul preached is the very same gospel that the world needs tonight. What is the gospel that Paul preached? What is the gospel that Paul was willing to die for? Well, most of you know that the word gospel, and the literal meaning of it is good news. But that brings another question. Good news about what? What is this good news that Paul calls the gospel? Well, we find that Paul himself gives the answer to that. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's from the chapter we used this morning in speaking about the resurrection, and that's going to be our theme tonight. But I want you to notice what, if you had to give a definition of the gospel, somebody asked you, what is the gospel? What is it? Well, it had better be the gospel that Paul preached because he says any other gospel is a perverted gospel. Well, Paul describes in no uncertain terms what the gospel is. Here we find it in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, chapter 15, Verse 1 through 4. Let me read it, if I might. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also, listen to this, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that, here's the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That right there is the gospel in the nutshell. That right there tells us exactly what the gospel is. You see, the message of the gospel is simply this. It's a message of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul says any other gospel, any gospel that does not contain those three things, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, any other gospel that does not have that in its teaching is a false and perverted gospel. You see, the death has to do with his suffering and sacrifice on that cross. Oh, if I could have had the time to preach tonight. The awful atrocities, the awful suffering, the awful pain, the awful agony that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, suffered as they took him to that cross, as he voluntarily laid down his life, as they took those great spikes and drove them through his, the palms of his hand and into the, uh, his feet 
and then picked that old cross up and dropped it with a thud into the ground. Oh, listen, it breaks my heart. But the, the death is part of the gospel. We must preach the death of the Lord Jesus Christ because the death on that cross was his sacrifice for the sin of the world. But also the burial then is a testimony of his sovereignty. You see, he was buried in that tomb for three days, pre-planned by God, pre-ordained by the Father, that on that third day, that, more, that third morning, he would rise up victorious from that tomb as a testimony that he was God in the flesh. You see, his burial is a testimony of his sovereignty. But then the resurrection, that is, that is what seals forever the assurance of our salvation. Because I'm going to repeat tonight some things that I mentioned this morning. I hope you'll bear with me. They, they bear repeating, and repetition is not bad. Every once in a while, we just need to be reminded of some things. We need to, be, we need to have some things repeated to us that we might not forget what the resurrection is all about. And so tonight, I want to say this. According to this gospel that Paul is mentioning here, that's the gospel right there. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. And, I, uh, uh, and according to those scriptures, I would say to you what I said this morning, if there had been no resurrection, then his Christ's life, Christ's death, and his burial would have no meaning. And Paul says any other gospel, any other that leaves out the sacrificial death, that leaves out the burial, and leaves out the glorious resurrection, it is a false and perverted gospel. Why is that? Simply this. It is through the resurrection that the death and the burial have any meaning. Again, as I believe I said this morning, without the resurrection, we have no gospel to preach, we have no hope to proclaim, and we have no faith to, prof to pro profess to a lost and dying world on it. So the Bible makes it cl uh, clear how important the doctrine and the preaching of the gospel, the death, the burial, and especially the resurrection, how important it is as we proclaim the, the message of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. Now tonight, just simply, I have a simple message. I want to preach to you on the results of the resurrection. What does a resurrection mean to you and me, literally? It's not, just a, uh, it's not just something we say we believe. And it's, it's not just something we preach. It's imperative that we preach it. But the resurrection, according to the Bible, was, ve was very important. And the resurrection had to take place that some things might happen. I'm going to show you tonight that your salvation, or, or I'll put it this way, there are four things about your salvation that would not be possible if it were not for the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul was so adamant that when we preach the gospel, we preach both the death, the burial, and the resurrection. So then tonight, simply this, what does the resurrection mean to us who are living? Number one, I'm going to be, I want to use the Bible tonight, so I hope, again, as I turn to it, you'll bear with me. But number one, apart from the resurrection, there is no personal salvation, number one. 
Now, I covered that pretty well this morning, but I, I want to say a few things about it tonight. And so if you'll turn to Romans chapter 10 again, as we did this morning, I want you to notice what Paul writes about this personal salvation. I'll not read it all, but I'll read verse 9. Here's what God says. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Oh, listen to me, dear ones, whoever might be out there uh, uh, through the internet. I, I pray that you hear it and hear it well. Uh, without the resurrection, there is no possibility of you or me or anyone being saved or born again. You see, it's not just believing in a historical Christ, it's believing that he not only lived and died. A lot of people will tell me, preacher, yeah, I know, I know Jesus lived. Oh, yeah, I know that he was a, he was a prophet. I know that he was a great teacher and all this stuff. But you've got to go a step farther. And it's not only believing he lived and died, but it's believing by faith that he victoriously rose from that grave as a risen, resurrected Savior. We are saved now. Let me, let me put it this way. We are saved, of course, by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the blood would have no power were it not for the resurrection. I'll, I'm going to give you some scripture. You see, by Christ shedding his blood, he paid for your sin. That was the payment. Sin had to be paid for. You couldn't pay for it. Paul, uh, Peter says we can't buy it. Uh, Paul writes in another place we can't earn it. Another place the Bible says we don't deserve it. Salvation is made possible because Jesus Christ paid for it by his blood. I want you to uh, turn with me, if you will, to Hebrews. And I believe it's in uh, <clears throat> chapter 9 and verse 22. Hebrews 9 and verse 22. Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, by the way. And here's what he writes in this verse. And almost all things by the law, or by, excuse me, and almost, almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no payment. For my sin or your sin, that God will accept, except the shed blood of, of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross that's behind me. The blood paid for our sin, but the resurrection provided the assurance that that payment was in full uh, there. You, uh, there. You see, I, I said again uh, this morning, a dead Christ, a dead Savior cannot save anyone. And if Jesus Christ were still in that grave today, or if his bones were in that grave today, there would be no salvation. The blood would not have any effect. His life would not have had any meaning had there not been a victorious resurrection. And because he, di he, he died, yes. He shed his blood, yes. But 2,000 years ago today, he rose from the dead victorious. And because of that, I can say and I can shout and I praise God, we have a salvation that no one else has uh, on it there. Uh, on it. So, the, uh, 
if you have not received and believed in the, the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you are lost and in darkness and without any hope in this world. The resurrection assures us that we're saved. My salvation is not made possible by a man who died and is still dead and his, and his bones are still rotting in the grave. My salvation this, mo this evening is made possible because that man not only died, he not only shed his blood, but he victoriously rose from that grave that I might have salvation. But let me give you an another result of the resurrection. This is unusual. A lot of folk don't understand this. But the gospel assures us, you see, we're talking about the gospel of the resurrection of Jesus. Any other gospel is of no avail. Number one, it assures us of our salvation. Number two, it provides our justification. Not only our salvation, but our justification. In Romans, if you'll uh, turn with me, or if you're following in your Bible at home, I hope that you are. <clears throat> but in Romans chapter 4, I want to share this with you. <clears throat> We're ta he, uh, I'm talking about justification. That's a big word, and a lot of people don't know what it is. But it simply means this. Because Jesus rose from the dead, his payment for our sin by his blood, he, he, that justifies us before Almighty God. Now in Romans chapter 4, that's a long chapter, and it deals with an Old Testament patriarch by the name of Abraham. I'm going to read verses 1 through uh, 3, and then I'm going to uh, move down. But it says this, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? What's Abraham found? For if Abraham, now follow, for if Abraham were justified by works, he hath wherefore to glory, but not before God. Please hear me, church. If you are trying to justify yourself to God by works, you're going to find out God will not accept anything you fleshly can do. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, Paul writes in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. So he says, Abraham, if he were justified by works, man, he, he might be justified before man. I might look upon some of you and I see your good works and I say, man, what a tremendous uh, Christians they are uh, and all of that. You could be justified. I hope you follow me. You could be justified in my sight, but unless you have come by the way of the cross, you cannot be justified in God's sight. Let's go ahead and read here. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God now get this, not works. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now, look, I, I want to go down to verse um, 24. Abraham was justified by faith in God, not by works. Now let's see what he says about us. In Romans 4, 24, he says, For us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him, get this, you won't get this without having a Bible. It says, If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again, for our justification. Do you get it? 
Do you understand it? If Jesus Christ had not risen from the dead, as the Bible says he did, there would be no justification on our part before Almighty God. Our justification is not in what we do. Hallelujah tonight. It's in what Jesus has already done. Amen. I'm so thankful for that on it uh, there. Now, the Bible says, uh, well, what is justification? Someone put it like this. There are those who kind of, they, they, they kind of say, well, that's just a trite saying. But <clears throat> justification is, uh, is simply this. Just as I have never sinned. Justification. Just as I have never sinned. Now you, it's hard to comprehend that. And you probably won't understand, some of you, what I'm going to say. But tonight, I am justified by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And uh, uh, now I, I'm not perfect. He didn't say we would be sinless. Didn't say that. I, the, for the Bible says we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But tonight by my faith in a resurrected living Christ, I am justified and God looks upon Fred Cowardin just as if he had never sinned. That's hard to swallow, but that's justification. Oh, yes, I've sinned. Oh, yes, I will sin tomorrow. Oh, yes, I will, I will sin the next day. But in the eyes of God, when it comes to be, be, uh, being justified, God looks upon me. Now, follow this. God looks upon me. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And when he looks upon Fred Cowardin through the blood of Jesus Christ. He sees no sin. Whatsoever. Whoa, yes, brother David. Amen. You see, uh, I'll use another term. It's kind of hard for folks to swallow. But it's biblical. He, God, through Christ and his resurrection and his shed blood on Calvary, God has declared us righteous. That's it. He has declared me righteous. Oh, no, I'm not righteous in the flesh. I know that. No man, the Bible says, is justified in the flesh. But thank God, thank God, my justification is not in what I do, but it's in what Jesus Christ did 2,000 years ago. Now, the shed blood, the blood had to be shed. There's no doubt about that. But for that shed blood to declare me righteous, Jesus Christ had to rise from the dead in order for that blood to be the payment for my sin. Amen. That's why the resurrection is so important to the Christian. Number three, the gospel assures us that the resurrection makes possible our intercession. Oh, I tell you, I get, I get thrilled about this. Romans chapter 8. It, I'm, let me read it. Here, I'm already in Romans. Chapter 8 and verse 32. I hope, I, I, I understand. You're probably, if you're listening, you don't have a Bible, you, you, have, you probably may have a hard time digesting this because you need to see it in the Word of God. This is what God said. Not what Brother Cowden thinks, what my, no, what's not my opinion, but what God says. Listen, 
that Jesus rose from the dead that we might, that he might intercede at the throne of God for you and me. Let me read it. Romans 8, 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Listen to this, verse 33, Romans 8. It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again, who is, listen to this, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Do you get it? If he were still in that grave today, 2,000 years ago, if Jesus were still buried in that tomb, we would have no one to intercede for us at the throne of grace. <laughs> wow. He had to rise from the dead in order to make possible our intercession. Hebrews, listen to this. Oh, man. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. Let me read this. I wish you could read it. I wish you, I hope some of you got your Bible. Hebrews 7, 25. Wherefore he, that's Christ, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost. <laughs> not halfway, not part way, not a little way. Praise God tonight, I'm saved to the uttermost. Amen. Amen. Now, notice what it says. He is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Do you know where Jesus is tonight? The Bible says he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. What's he doing up there? He's sitting there as a intercessor, or you might say a lawyer, for you and for me. And every time old Slewfoot, the devil, approaches God on, uh, to charge Fred Cowden with something, he begins to talk to God and say, you know down there, you see what he's done, you watch, what, uh, you watch what's going on. And while that old rotten devil is charging me, Jesus gets up from the throne and he comes over and says, Father, two thousand years ago, I died for Fred Tower. Amen. Two thousand years ago, I rose from the dead that I might stand up here. And I and he received me as his savior at the age of 16. He, I, I shed my blood for him. And you know what he says? I find no charge against Fred Cowardly. Amen. Woo, how do you know that? You got your Bibles? Let's follow up. Romans 8. It says, verse 34 then, Paul asks, Three or four questions. Because, listen, get this. Because Jesus is at the right hand of the Father making intercession for me. Look at verse 34. There is no one to condemn me. Here's what it says. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Look at this. I'm telling you about the resurrection. It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also make intercession, intercession for us. I get so excited sometimes I, I lose my train of thought. 
What I'm saying is, because he rose from the dead, sitting at the right hand of the Father, on my behalf, on your behalf, if you're saved, there is no condemnation can be brought against you. Boy, that ought to make a Baptist shout. And I've been preaching 60 some years, and I've, he I've yet to hear a Baptist shout. But that ought to do it. But not only is there no condemnation because of his intercession, in verse 35, there is no separation. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No! I am signed, sealed, and delivered. And I have an intercessor at the right hand of the Father. He's sitting there on my behalf. And nothing, nothing can separate me from the love of God. Amen. 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 No accusation. No separation. No condemnation. Praise God tonight, church. We have a high priest. I don't need a priest down here with his collar turned around in a little cubicle somewhere. And every week I have to go and confess my sin to him. And he says, my son, I absolve your sin. Let me tell you something tonight. There's no man on the face of the earth. I don't care who he is. There's no man on the face of the earth can absolve your sin but the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't need to go to some guy and confess your sin to him. But you need to come to Jesus and confess your sin to him. He's the high priest. Where is he? At the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and for me. Oh, how important was a resurrection. But let me give you the last point tonight. The gospel of the resurrection assures us, this is the best of all, it assures us of our own Resurrection. <laughs> Woo! Let's look at let's look at First Thessalonians if just a moment here. First Thessalonians chapter four. Verse fourteen through sixteen. Uh, verse eight through verse eighteen. Can't cut it short. Listen to this. Please listen to this. It says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also sleep, there's that word sleep again, means death, also which died in Jesus, will God bring with him. For we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and hallelujah, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then he concludes it with these wonderful words, Wherefore, Comfort one another with these words. Folks, not only did Jesus Christ bodily rise from the dead, but there's coming a day that all those who have died in Jesus Christ, those who have been truly saved, there's coming a day when the trumpet's going to sound and all the graves of the saved are going to burst open and the saints shall be called up in the air to meet their Lord because He lives. Jesus said, because I live, you shall live also. Hallelujah. What a Savior. What a Savior. That is, that's why the resurrection is so important. 
it assures me that as he rose from the dead, one day, if if I, I want to go with the rapture, personally. But if Jesus doesn't come before I die, I'm going to die, and so are you. Now let me let me clarify something. I'm just going to take some time tonight. You can turn me off or whatever you want to do. But listen, when you close your eyes in death, according to the Apostle Paul in Corinthians, you're going to open them if you're saved. Now we're talking about saved. You're going to open them in the presence of Jesus Christ. There is no such thing on the face of God's earth. There is not one thing in God's book that even hints to what we some of these cults are teaching on soul sleeping. No such, you can't prove it. But I can prove the resurrection. That body, yes, that body is asleep. But do you know something? I don't understand all this. I don't pretend to. This body is not me. This body is housing me. My soul, my spirit dwells in this body. But when this body is laid to rest and when this body is buried in the ground, I will be with Jesus. Amen. And then one day when the trumpet sounds, time shall be no more. The rapture of the, of, of the church for God's people takes place. My old body is going to come up and it's going to be reunited with my spirit. Amen. I am promised that. And if Jesus had not risen from the dead, I would have no promise whatsoever that I would rise either on it. Oh, listen. Can you imagine what a day that's going to be? Woo! And may I close with this tonight. The rapture with the sound of the trumpet is a lot nearer than most of us think. I don't know when it's going to be. I don't know what hour, what day, what month, or what year. But I know this. The Bible says by, by certain things in the Word of God, I don't believe it's going to be long. I really don't. I know, uh, you know, Peter dealt with that very same thing. Peter said they were those in his day who mocked the resurrection, made fun of it, of the second coming of Jesus, saying, oh, you preach that, you preach that, you preachers preach that, but nothing's happened. Can I say this tonight? No, it hasn't happened yet. But every day that passes is one day closer to its happening. And dear one, whoever you might be on the internet, you hear me tonight. It might be tomorrow. And the point is, if it was tomorrow, would you be ready to meet him in the air? Or, more precise tonight, if you die before the rapture takes place, which if Jesus tarries, most of us will. But if we do, are you ready to meet Jesus face to face? Everyone, every funeral I've ever preached, almost, not always, but almost. Every funeral I ever preached, the person that was in that coffin before me a few days prior did not think they would be in that coffin. 
Jesus says, put off, do not put off tomorrow what you need to do today. Amen, Paul writes in Corinthians, today, now, is the day of salvation. Why? Because I close with this. You have no promise of a tomorrow. One way or the other, it's either the upper taker or it's the undertaker. But you're going to spend eternity somewhere. As sure as I'm standing here, you're going to spend eternity somewhere. It will either be heaven or it will be hell, depending on what you personally have done with the resurrected Christ. Do you know Him as your Savior? Are you rejoicing in these results that the resurrection has brought us? The blessings of the resurrection. Oh, our salvation, our justification, our intercession. Are you ready? If it were today, let's pray. Father, in a skeptic and sinful and wicked world, I do not know who's listening to this message. I do not know where they are or who they are. But I do know this. I know this for a fact. You know. You know every one of them. And you know tonight whether they're saved or whether they're lost. And Father, you know you want them saved. We want to see people saved. Lord God. But we know this. They have a choice. They can make that decision or they can reject it. But whatever decision they make will determine where they're going to spend eternity. Thank you, Father, for your Son who rose from the dead 2,000 years ago today, and who is alive evermore. He's at the right hand of the Father. And through Him, we have salvation, we have justification, we have intercession, and the promise of our own resurrection. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. We love you. We pray for these folk that are listening in. We ask God that you speak to them as only the Holy Spirit can. We pray for our church and our people until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you tonight.